Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining. Everybody's entering now, so we're gonna wait a few minutes. Thank you very much for being here. Can you guys see my screen? Is it moving? Yes, yes Jay. Perfect. But it's not. It's not moving. It's on. It's not on presentation mode, Jay. Oh, okay. Hang on. Okay, for the people that are joining now, we're just waiting for a few minutes, and making sure our screens are correctly shared. So, thank you for joining. We'll begin in a few minutes. Okay, so I think we could already start with our webinar. Thanks everyone for joining. Victor, if you can share the um, introduction slides. Um, well, just for all our panelists, we have interpretation in Spanish, Portuguese and French. So please, click on the world icon and choose the language that you prefer. Okay, wait one second.
Okay, so while we get the screen shared, which is going to happen in a minute, I'm going to start this webinar. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day, everyone, because this is an international webinar series. We have people joining from all parts of the world. So sorry, people in Asia, because it's quite late and people in Latin America, because it's quite early. But I'm very, very happy to welcome everyone to this third version of our international webinar series around the GCF Watch. I'm Florencia Ortuzar Green. I work for AIDA, which is the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense. And AIDA is a regional NGO that has been following up on the GCF for a long time. And it is also currently serving as the GCF Watch regional node for Latin America. And the GCF Watch, for those of you who haven't heard about it, is an information platform on the GCF which is available online and is led by organizations of the South. And it seeks to promote more participation of Southern civil society with the GCF. You'll, you'll hear more about the GCF Watch in a minute. So let's go to the next one, Camila, please. So I want to th begin by thanking our interpreters, which are here, and that will make it possible for everyone to hear this session in three different languages, apart from English, we have interpretation in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. And whoever needs to hear or prefers to hear in one of these languages, please click on the icon with the world uh, symbol and choose your preferred language. So there you can see in the image. Um, the next one, please. So I'll also want to thank all the organizations uh, and their representatives who have been key in planning this event and who are participating in it. Uh, it is very nice to see that we have partners from all over the world collaborating with this important initiative, which, as I said, is the third version. So with, this is the third year that, that we do this capacity building webinar where we gather people from all over the globe to talk about the importance of following up on the GCF to get it, make its mission of helping countries to deal with climate change in the best possible way. So we decided to make this event international, just one event for everyone, with the time difference, This that the, the problem that this comes with, because uh, the GCF watch owes much of its potential to the fact that it allows the joining of efforts throughout different regions. So today we have a great opportunity to have people from all over the world in this table. We take advantage of the virtual space that makes this possible. So here we have people from all over the place, including people from the three regional nodes represented in the GCF Watch, which are Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I'd also want to mention that the GCF Watch is part of a larger network known as the GCF Civil Society Organization Network, which is a collaboration platform for civil society, indigenous peoples, and local community organizations from developed and developing countries all around the world, working around the GCF to make it accountable, to push for the correct implementation of its policies, and for it to comply effectively with its very important mission, which is to provide the much needed climate resources to alleviate climate change in mitigation and in adaptation for countries that need this help. So on a personal note, I always like to say that I'm very impressed with the way this network of organization works, because in spite of the fact that it has a very ample geographic distribution, which is obviously a challenge, collaboration works very smoothly. And thanks to the work of this network, the board is constantly provided with key information from civil society and from local communities, which might have been missing from their decisions. So if, if it were not for the work of all these organizations that are gathered around this network, maybe the board wouldn't have this important information that comes from the territories, which is key to having good climate finance. So obviously this has everything to do with the important work that is being done in spaces such as this one, where we gather everyone, and we reflect on what is going on and how we can make climate finance more effective, more country driven and more useful for local communities that are suffering the worst of climate change. It's all about providing a bridge between 
financial institutions that are taking these very important decisions up there, far away from the territories, and the people that are affected by climate change and also by the projects and programs that are financed in name of climate change. So some communities benefit by these projects and programs, and that is what we hope for, but sometimes bad things happen and they can even be harmed by this money. So it's so important, it's very important that a civil society organization, we stand there building the bridge, connecting decisions with the territories. And none of this work would be possible if we didn't have interest and engagement from the people that work from the ground. So that is many of you guys that are there in your own countries following up on climate finance more directly related to what goes on your countries. So thank you so much for being here and for following up. So the next slide, I'm going to present you about what will happen in today's session. We will begin with an introduction on the GCF and some topics that are especially hot these days specifically the new updated strategic plan of the GCF and the second replenishment process, which is happening now. This will be presented by Jay Edora from the Asian People Movement for Depth and Development, which is a regional NGO. Then we will have a tour of the GCF Watch platform, which I mentioned already, by Ira Guerrero from the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities from the Philippines. After this, we will have an open conversation with two of our active observers before the GCF, Leanne Schalatek and Erika Lennon, who are both based in the US, and they will talk about the way we work in the network, the way they work as the active observers, they're the ones that have a right to be in the board meetings, and why we do what we do. And before we pass to the open sessions of questions and interaction with the audience, that's you, my colleague Camila Bartelega from AIDA, which is a regional NGO for Latin America, will moderate an interactive session with online polls to understand a bit more about the way civil society organizations around the world interact around the GCF and what they need to be more involved. So in that way, we might be able to plan even better what we do to be able to connect better with everyone that's doing work on the ground. So the next slide, please. And after that, we will have a space for questions and interactions with the panelists. So we ask you, please, to write down your questions in the box for questions that's available there in the, in the, hand, in the Zoom handles during all the duration of the webinar. And we will address this at the end. If you want, if it's possible, you can put to whom your question is addressed. And the next session, the next slide. So regarding the next sessions, because this is a, a webinar series, we have three sessions. The first one is today. Then we have one in October 11, which will be about the implementation of projects approved by the GCF, which is something very interesting that organizations have started to look into recently. So historically, we've always been much more worried about the approval of projects and programs, but now so since some time ago, we have already begun looking into the implementation of projects, which is obviously something very interesting to do. And we now have a few um, case studies from the different regions, which we will talk about on October 11. And on November 8th, the last session will cover some relevant topics for our work, namely that we will have a short presentation slash course course on how to connect with the GCF at the country level. So how can we be more connected to our accredited entities, which are the ones that channel the funds, and with our national designated authorities, which are the ones that connect the GCF with our countries. We will also talk about the indigenous people's policy, about gender at the GCF, which is a very important and interesting topic, and about the IRM, which is the Independent Redress Mechanism of the GCF. And there we have confirmed we will have someone from the IRM who will talk about how to access this important mechanism and what their experience up to now has been like. So with the registration you did to come to this webinar, you are automatically registered for all three sessions. So we look forward to see you today on the 11th of October and on the 8th of November. And with this, I pass the microphone to Jay Idora, part of the Asian People's Movement for Depth and Development, who will give his introduction. So thank you very much for listening, for being here, and thank you, Jay Edora, for your presentation. Hi, thank you, Florencia. Um, good day to everyone. So I'll share my screen. 
for a while. Um, can yeah. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, Jay, but you're not in presentation mode. Yeah, there. Can you see it now? Yes, I can see it, but I, I can right. see your, the slides that are coming after that one. So you're not in the oh. presentation mode. There, I'm no. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to figure this out. <laughs> There's a little icon below. Okay. Um, that one, I guess. Yes, I'd say this, that one. Is it better now? No. No, but well, that's good. Okay. Strange. Well, but I think this do. will this will do. Is it yes, okay? This will do definitely. <laughs> yes, say it properly. I, apologies, okay. everyone. That's fine. Um, okay. So um hi everyone. My name is Jay Eduardo III. I'm with the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development, and I'm here to give you an introduction about the Green Climate Fund. So just a little bit of background on climate finance. So climate finance is a response for, um, is the resources needed for climate action. Um, so let's ask why is climate finance even necessary and what brought about the climate crisis that we're currently experiencing? So because of the excessive cumulative historical emissions of developed countries, which we could also call rich industrialized countries or the global north, they have caused the climate crisis. As you know, these excessive cumulative historical emissions have been going on since the dawn of industrialization or since the 1850s. And these um, have, a, have Trap, um, they have caused the overpollution of our atmosphere. Thus, there have been changes in the earth. Um, because of this, we have we now have to collaborate and at the same time partner on solving this climate crisis. Even those who have very little, um, very little contribution to the climate crisis now have to pursue a low carbon development pathway for develop or for their own development. So these developing countries or the global south now have to do more than their fair share of climate action. So climate finance could be broken down into three. There is mitigation finance, adaptation finance, and loss and damage finance. Mitigation finance deals with the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, um, adaptation finance is to build the resilience of the peoples and communities who are greatly affected by the climate change impacts. Loss and damage um, finance is to address, avert, and minimize the losses and damages. These are the permanent and irreversible losses and damages brought forth by the climate crisis. So all of, um, so this responsibility of developed countries, of these rich industrialized countries, they are enshrined in the United Nations Framework and Convention on Climate Change, or as we call the UNFCCC. And under the UNFCCC, these developed countries are um, obligated to provide finance to the global south or for developing countries to lessen their greenhouse gas emissions or mitigation, build resilience or adaptation. Um, so loss and damage is a totally different topic, not under the UNFCCC, but even um, current climate negotiations are ongoing in order to um, frame the responsibility of developed countries to provide climate finance for loss and damage as well. So um, as I mentioned, um, climate finance is a response to, um, pro, um, is it's, it's provided in order to um, lessen greenhouse gas emissions. And the Green Climate Fund is um, a fund created to manage and facilitate the um, receiving of these climate finance from developed countries and the administration of it to developing countries or to the global south. So it started. Um, it was initially um, agreed in Cancun in COP in COP sixteen, or in twenty ten, that there would be a green climate fund. Um, before it was not called the Green Climate Fund yet. There was a different name, and I've been have. I, I mean, I was preparing for this presentation. There have been very conflicting um, suggestions on what the name, what the name was during that time, but. Um, 
let's just say that it was initially um, conceptualized during the Cancun agreements. So from 2010 to 2015, it was the initial resource mobilization period of the Green Climate Fund where it will seek to raise the resources that it will initially use to administer climate projects for, for the Global South. So it was able to say raise um 10 billion of pledges from developed countries and other countries as well so but um if foreign exchanges lock, um are factored in and at the same time the non delivery of the united states of its initial pledge were um, factored in it will only be 7 billion so on 2015 the first funding approval of the gcf was approved and from 2017 to 2019, the GCF entered its first replenishment, or as we call the GCF-1, where it was able to raise $9 billion worth of pledges. Currently, it's in the second replenishment phase with its target of $20 billion. The GCF um, is one of the, is among the um, three uh, climate finance mechanisms under the UNFCCC, along with the Global Environment Facility or the GEF and the Adaptation Fund. But under the Paris Agreement, it's supposed to be the main finance mechanism for mitigation and adaptation, since compared to the GEF and the Adaptation Fund, the Green Climate Fund only um, currently focuses on mitigation and adaptation. The GEF has um, environmental and biodiv um, biodiversity projects. So that's the um, that's the distinction of the GCF among the three. The mandate of the GCF is very simple. It's to mobilize climate finance from developed countries, accept voluntary contributions from developing countries and philanthropies, and implement mitigation and adaptation projects in the global south. So how does the GCF work? So in four steps, first, the GCF mobilizes pledges from Annex 1 countries under the UNF policy. So these are G7 countries and others. Um, it sets rules on how to access climate finance within its, um, per, um, with its when, um, to access the climate finance that it manages. So the GCF also accredits partner organizations and institutions such as banks, CSOs, and other financial institutions that will be eligible to submit funding proposals and implement GCF projects in the Global South. So these um, accredited partners are what we call um, AEs or accredited entities. There are two types of accredited entities, which are the direct access entities and the international access entities. So we'll delve in more on the difference of both. And there's a GCF board where they approve funding proposals and they also approve um, GCF policies. So it's composed of 12 developing countries and 12 developed countries. So they, um, the constituencies, they talk among each other and they, um, they determine on who's going to be nominated and who's going to sit, or who's going to seat at the particular seat allotted for develop or developing countries. So some figures about the GCF right now. So the GCF has a total funding or financing of 12.78 billion. And 7.3 billion of that goes to mitigation versus 5.4 billion going to adaptation. There, um, this figure is very important since one of the mandates of the GCF is to have 50-50 uh, funding or uh, funding for mitigation versus adaptation. But as you can see, 58% goes to mitigation. So it's not 50-50. And we could also deduce that since mitigation projects are usually energy projects and these are very bankable and investable projects where profit is involved, this is usually the most preferred um, project proposed by the accredited entities of the GCF. However, adaptation is slowly gaining traction and we are continuously campaigning for the balance of mitigation and adaptation. The GCF has also a breakdown of 41% uh, of its funding goes to loans, 41% goes to grants, and 18% goes to financial instruments or other financial instruments. These other financial instruments are um, results-based payments, equities, and guarantees as the GCF tries to diversify its financial instrument mix. Um, there are a lot... Um, so I'll go back to these figures or why this why these figures are relevant eventually. Um, a lot other figures, there are a total of 118 accredited entities under the GCF right now. With, but the problem with this is that 
even though there's a total of 180 accredited entities and most of these are direct access entities, it's still the international access entities that receive most of the GCF funding with a total of 10 billion of the GCF's money or that's around um, it's around more than 60% of the GCF or 174 projects are, um, act, are within the access of international access entities. Um, the difference is these IAEs have more resources to propose projects and to have projects approved compared to direct access entities or the APs who have less resources to get um, to comply with GCF policies and the project proposal pr um, process of the GCF. So the average accreditation speed, if you want to access GCF resources, it usually takes two years and IEs take significantly less time before they get to submit their first funding proposal for the GCF's consideration. So in the project cycle speed, the average speed of getting a project from concept note into board approval is around three years. But um, this, uh, this is slowly improving. And at the same time, similar with accreditation, IEEs, um, IEEs take shorter time to get their projects from concept note to board approval since they have more resources to comply with GCF policies that, that outline the requirements or standards for GCF projects. Um, as mentioned a while ago by Florentia, we're going to tackle some topics or emerging topics or hot topics about the GCF right now. So the GC, uh, the second replenishment is one of them. So the GCF is, as I mentioned, it's currently going undergoing its second replenishment, and it so far it has received four point ninety eight billion worth of pledges from Germany, Monaco, Austria, um, Canada, Denmark, Czech Republic, South Korea, and the United and United Kingdom. So the UK one was very recent during the G um G twenty summit. But for GCF two, they target. <laughs> Excuse me. They target twenty billion, but our um climate finance groups and at the same time um global south um CSOs and communities are still crying um are still demanding more since the climate finance needs of the global south are estimated to be at the trillions for um uh, for us to limit global warming below one point five degrees Celsius and to address the worsening climate impacts. So for the updated strategic plan, um, I just give a background on what the updated what the updated strategic plan is or the USP. So the USP gives guidance on how a particular replenishment period or how the money raised during a particular replenishment period is used. So these update the most recent updated strategic plan for 2022 to 2027 would be um, the guidance on how GCF2 or the race resources from the second replenishment will be used. Um, how did the this how did this new updated strategic plan go forth. So it was recently approved in the 36 ward meeting, and it was not as contentious or highly debatable in public or during the boardroom as the previous of the um, strategic plans. Because um, I recall come, to, come the 28th board meeting, the, it took them a lot of hours just to settle the, um, the strategic plan for 2020 to 2023. Uh, so these are the particular interests or agendas that were apparent um, based on the discussions and on the comments of the particular constituencies. So for the developed country constituencies, they are still um, they want private more private sector involvement in the GCF, and they also want to pursue more the greening of the financial sector or the global financial sector or financial sectors in general. Um, with MDBs or multilateral development banks such as the World Bank, the ADB, um, the IDB as major participants in this greening of the financial sector. The developing countries, although not really um, in, although they're not really against what the developed countries are pushing, but they all they were very um very very vocal on scaling of funding for adaptation as you guys know the in there is a big imbalance right now, and they also agree with private sector involvement although they're not part they're not very privy on what kind of private sector are we talking about since, um developed countries in the past are very vocal about the inclusion of banks and big private sector on the GCF. 
So as CSOs or the CSO network, we've been very vocal and uh, very uh, active in saying that whatever goals that you would put in US in the USP, unless there is adequate and predictable climate finance to achieve this, it will not be achieved. And the developing countries during the deliberation, they supported this position, albeit not as not as cons uh, not as exactly as um we've, as we've tried to frame it. So CSOs um also were pushing for locally led adaptation since um adaptation currently is uh although I'm not going to categorically say that it's not informed by indigenous knowledge but the policy the uh the common play is that it's sometimes um forgotten it's not the mainstream approach to adaptation so we've been pushing to value indigenous people's knowledge indigenous knowledge and locally led adaptation since this is proven to be scientifically effective um, private sector, uh, we're also advocating for more private sector involvement, but we want to qualify this by including micro, small, and medium enterprises because we want to help local economy grow and be able to service climate needs of the peoples and communities of the global south. No to be, um, not big banks, since big banks are very active in participating in the GCF and they 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 associate themselves with as one private sector, but it's very different. The experience of MSMEs and banks in the GCF are very different. And the benefits are also very different. So we want more focus on MSMEs and local economic development. We also support for, uh, we also were pushing to be included in the USP, the um, active participation of CSOs, and at the same time, financial support for CSOs to participate since usually CSOs participate, um, CSO participation in the, in the GCF processes, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's an afterthought, but it's not, um, it's not as, it's not as one of the requirements in how they engage us. They usually, um, just include us if we say that we have comments on particular items and we're we want this included in the USP to be part of the um part of the what will be the focus for the next few years and at the same time active engagement of stakeholders rather than just being a requirement we want this to be the center of how projects and policies in the GCF are approved and made so just to close this introduction um, the CSO network has been calling for an ambit ambitious GCF2 or second replenishment. And we will continue to um, demand the urgent delivery of adequate, non-debt creating, predictable, accessible, and unconditional climate finance. Since this is beyond the GCF, we, we need this. The global south needs this to limit global temperature rise below 1.5 and at the same time respond to the worsening impacts of the climate crisis to save the people and planet. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay, for a very insightful presentation. Thank you for explaining a bit on the basics of the GCF and also what is going on now, because there's always something going on. So thank you very much for that. Um, so now we're going to go with Ira Guerrero, who is going to uh, present us on the GCF Watch platform, which gives us a lot of uh, possibilities of interaction with civil society that is doing work with the GCF. So the floor is yours, Ira. Yeah, thank you, Florencia. Um, let me just share my screen. So yeah, um, good evening, um, everyone. Good evening from the Philippines, and I hope you're all having a Good day. Uh, my name is Ayra Dominic Guerrero, and I am the communicate external communications manager of the Institute for Climate and Sustainability. So we are a Philippine-based climate and energy policy group uh, working to advance fair climate policy and low carbon development. So I'm here to talk about the GCF Watch platform and how civil society organizations can help contribute to this growing work. So let me just um, go through this context setting quickly, since I think Jay already covered them uh, in his introduction. So yeah, um, most CSOs um, in our line of work. Um, and yeah, as Jay explained earlier, um, the Green Climate Fund is central to the uh, global climate finance architecture. 
and to ensure that uh, the GCF is transparent and equitable, um, the active involvement of diverse stakeholders should be at its core. So the Observer Network of Civil Society, Indigenous Peoples, and Local Communities represent a huge knowledge base that is responsible for the groundbreaking work and grassroots mobilization. So the GCF Watch platform um, can serve as one of the venues to amplify this call. So yeah, as Jay also discussed in um, the previous presentation, um, this year marks a critical juncture for the GCF as the updated strategic plan was adopted in the 30, 36th board meeting and uh, the fund second replenishment is set to be finalized this October. So the USP along with the second replenishment sets out the long-term um, path for the GCF. So this makes our work in the CSO Observer Network all the more important in this crucial time in order for our um, collective call to reach the stakeholders that we want to target. So this slide shows just some snippets of the statements that the Observer Network has delivered during the 36th board meeting of the GCF um, last July in Songdo, South Korea. So as you can see, the network's call is consistent. Um, we emphasize the need for the GCF to be centered on human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples, um, gender, uh, gender equality, and rights-based climate action. So um, we also emphasized um, in our intervention last board meeting that developed countries need to live up to their obligations and ambitiously replenish the GCF in the last board meeting. So these materials are just some examples of um, the outputs um, of, the, of the network that were released through GCF Watch. Um, and you can access these in our website and social media channels. So I'll be flashing those um, links later. So yeah, um, you have been hearing about um, GCF Watch since this webinar started. So what exactly is GCF Watch? So GCF Watch is a Southern CSO-led initi initiative established through um, the Observer Network aimed at promoting and accelerating global finance, global climate finance, as well as facilitating coordination and collaboration among CSO observers. So um, one of the targets of the Observer Network is to strengthen engagement and input in the GCF through sharing of information and collaboration on analysis, positions, and advocacy. And the GCF Watch platform serves as one of the venues for the network um, to do these um, to do these to achieve these um, practices. So yeah, um, as I've mentioned earlier, um, the GCF Watch also seeks to become a platform of elevating local concerns to the levels of formulation consultation, planning, and uh, implementation, and evaluation. So the GCF Watch platform is open for everyone, and its current structure um, is uh, it being led by a steering committee and an advisory council. So the steering committee is composed of the regional nodes, um, I mean representatives of the regional nodes, um, which are in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as um, enabling members composed of the active observers and conveners. So the steering committee um, is the highest governing body of GCF Watch, and it is responsible for ensuring the achievement of objectives and sustainability of this initiative. And um, the advisory council was invited to join GCF Watch to support the steering committee um yeah so um this is our um one of our i think ev evolving taglines in gcf watch is that it is made by cso's for cso's so gcf watch aims to share information 
on GCF processes in different countries more effectively. It aims to contribute to enabling local civil society to keep pace with national discussions, track more regularly and efficiently in-country progress regarding the Green Climate Fund. Um, it aims to serve as an information hub independent from the GCF Secretariat. And lastly, it serves as a one-stop shop for um, GCF CSO information. So currently, we are active in our digital platforms, particularly the GCF Watch website and social media channels, um, Facebook and Twitter. So however, um, there is still room and potential for improvement as the curation of content remains a huge challenge. So we definitely welcome more CSOs chipping in this initiative to ensure that we further amplify our work um, to be able to reach more stakeholders and hopefully achieve the optimal impacts for the GCF Watch platform. So how does um, the GCF Watch work? So um, first, um, first, we do content sharing. Um, through these organizations can share content materials as long as it follows um, basic guidelines and is in line with the mandate of GCF Watch. So um, you can access more information about the GCF Watch and its principles through our website, which I will be flashing later. Um, and then we go to content curation, where the steering committee and advisory council will manage how contributed content materials are presented, um, the timing of release, um, line of messages, etc., um, is considered in this process. And lastly, um, all materials, it is important to have um, the call to action in order to um, achieve what we, what we want to achieve and to be able to um, send stronger messages to, to the GCF and as well as um, the stakeholders that we want to target. So how can CSOs contribute to GCF Watch? So first, um, you can reach out to us mainly through the info at gcfwatch.org email, but you can also contact us through our regional nodes in Asia, um, Africa, and Latin America. So these emails are flashed in this slide. Um, and then the next step is to send your content. So please feel free to um, send stories, materials, and content that will be subject to the review and approval of GCF Watch um, Steering Committee and Advisory Council. Um, and then last, uh, the last step is to wait for the notice. So once uploaded, um, once these materials are uploaded, the contributor will be updated where it is located in the website, links, and next steps on digital promotion and distribution. So, well, this is the current um, process, but um, we definitely welcome uh, more suggestions on how to efficiently um, improve um, the way um, CSO partners can contribute to the platform. Um, and it's an evolving process. Um, so, um, this slide shows um, some of the materials that are uploaded on the website. So currently, we are more active in our digital platforms during board meetings of the GCF. So this slide shows um, the detailed updates that we are posting um, containing the daily board meeting updates that are produced by our colleagues in APMDD. Um, yeah, so as I've mentioned, we are more um, active during board meetings, but moving forward, we definitely hope to be able to release more content regularly, even outside board, board meetings, and we welcome inputs and suggestions from um, our partners in order to make this happen. So in this next slide, um, as you can see on the right side, um, we also house copies of the full interventions that we deliver in board meetings. Um, on the website. And then uh, as you can see on the left, um, this screenshot shows some of the materials that we have released outside board meetings. And we hope to release more materials like these 
in the future and that will need um, that will definitely need more contributions from um our CSO partners um so yeah um before i end the presentation i would like to um highlight this message that the network has been reiterating in our previous materials that we deliver um during board meetings and even outside i think this is somehow the one of the values that um shapes how the observer network um is working so um the contributions of civil society indigenous peoples and local communities the gcf who are on the ground and experience climate change impacts firsthand should be prioritized so this is not only our right um, but it is also a significant value add to discussion so i think jay also mentioned this type of message in his previous presentation so um and you will be hearing more about the the significant work that the network is doing from Leanne and Erica in the next presentation. So we look forward to working with everyone through GCF Watch in making the voices of CSOs, indigenous peoples, and local communities more prominent in the GCF and other um, global climate finance discussions. So that uh, ends my presentation. Thank you for listening. So for more information, about GCF Watch, you can visit these links. So the first one is our website and the next um, items mentioned are our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Um, we post content here and we hope you can help amplify um, the messages that we are releasing in your platforms as well, in your in, uh, individual and organizational platforms. And for more questions and clarifications about GCF Watch, you can reach out to this email uh, as well as our regional nodes, um, which I flashed um, earlier, the contact details. So thank you, and I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you, Ira. Thank you for this amazing presentation and the work you're doing. Actually, GCF Watch has been evolving very interesting throughout time. Mm -hmm. We have more and more things there for everyone to see. So in order to make it a very alive platform, it is great that, that people join in, propose things, uh, include content, et cetera. So yeah, and I and I very much agree with the, with the reflection you make about civil society's participation being not only a right, but a very valuable asset that these funds should appreciate much more. And that's well, that has to do with the work we are doing. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, okay, thanks. so now we're going to go to our next panel, which is an interactive conversation I'm going to hold with two um, of our active observers, which have done, which have come a long way in, in, in engaging with the GCF. So they have very interesting um, experiences to share with us. So hello, Erika and Lian. very happy to have you here. How are you doing? Hi, thank you very much for having us. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to ask um, uh, one question to each of you and then uh, two questions to both of you. No, three. So the first one I have prepared is for Erica and it goes like this. You have been fulfilling the role of active observer for some time. Can you tell us about what you do in practice and the day-to-day -day practice? How does it unfold day-to-day? -day? And in the end, how does the civil society organizations network function from your point of view? Sure, and thanks so much for the question and apologies for the weird changing lighting um, as I'm doing this. Uh, alongside another meeting. And so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the ways that we function in practice most is by really, um, as the active observers, sort of serving as a conduit um, for information and for connecting between um, civil society and people on the ground, local communities, indigenous peoples, et cetera, and the GCF. And so a lot of that is that 
A lot of the information comes from the GCF to the active observers. We then pass it out through, through our networks. We do outreach um, through networks to communities and to people on the ground. And we also help to try and collect information to then present it at the board meetings. So that's around board meetings and board advocacy to really develop our shared um, statements as, as civil society, as the observer network of civil societies, indigenous peoples and local communities, which is how we organize and, and who we represent. Um, and I will say that in addition, so there are two active observers, there's me representing developed countries and then Eileen, um, Myrina Cunningham representing developing countries, as well as our alternates, which include Liana um, and others. Um, and so on the day to day, I would say, in addition to sharing information from the GCF, we also share information um, about how to get in touch with board members, about how to get in touch with the GCF. We can also serve as a conduit for sharing that information from people directly to board members and to their advisors. Um, as we have a lot of contacts with them. Um, and we do a sort of overall trying to help coordinate the network um, and to, to develop shared materials, to develop shared policy positions um, and, and to really do collective advocacy to make the GCF the institution that we all uh, strived, that we all strive for it to be and that we all want it to be. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Erika. Totally agree. So um, now for you, Lian. Regarding the importance of civil society participation at the local level, which appears to be very key for you to be able to fulfill the work that you do more at the board level, how does the work that you do there at the international level connect with local organizations that are following up on climate finance at the local level, which many of the people in this webinar might uh, be some be working there. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Florencia. And I think that is a really crucial question because it speaks to the legitimacy of the observer network, right? We are an observer network of civil society uh, people, uh, of civil society organizations, indigenous peoples, and local communities, and that already reflects um, the focus that we have. So, um, uh, as Erica has pointed out, the conversation with the board and with the secretariat is meant as a as a two way street. Obviously, we import information to uh, the community, to people um, uh, and, and civil society representatives in recipient countries. But um, our main goal is to uplift the voices, the concerns and the contributions that come uh, from civil society organizations in the countries where the projects and the programs are being implemented um, and from the communities that are supposed to benefit from those projects and programs. And it's our primary focus um, actually, when we are engaging with the board and engaging with the secretariat to thinking uh, 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 very precisely what the benefits um, are of projects and projects, how they could be harmed, um, communities and uh, local groups and people by projects and pro uh, programs. So in order to, to safeguard or, or avoid some bad case scenario and actually um, do good, right? Um, not, not only lead to direct benefits, but also ensure that the policies and procedures with which um, they are put forward are continuously improved. So that means uh, we obviously, um, as Erica has mentioned, um, we intervene in board meetings, particularly on projects, but we can only do that if we understand the local context and the local concerns for projects on projects proposals that are coming um, uh, to the board. So that means we need to have some of that feedback or some of the experience um, of what actually would be help most helpful for communities on the ground. The same is then happening once a project um, is, is uh, approved. And this is actually um, you know, where GCF Watch comes back in. We are trying on the fund level to create a lot of opening for civil society to actually, and local communities to have the voice, including in feeding back concerns 
that are coming during the implementation. So that's the process called participatory monitoring, where we really want to have the ability to red flag things that are not going wrong. And then obviously civil society and local communities are also core important stakeholders for whatever in the recipient country, in the developing country is planned on a government level as engagement with the Green Climate Fund. And we want to make sure also um, that from the, from the government side, from um, the focal point or the national designated authority, which is the liaison to the fund, there is that engagement and that listening to what comes um, from local community and from civil society organizations in the country. Thank you, Leanne. I really see this as a like as a bridge because really nobody can do the whole the whole connection alone. So that's why it's so like it's beautiful to see that we need to work all together to make this happen. So yeah, people that are listening and that engage with the GCF are really a key part of what these brave ladies are doing there in their international arena. So thank you very much for putting that so clearly, Leanne. Um, so now I have a question that you could both answer because I think it's a very interesting one. And it says, we know that civil society organizations are many times openly critical with the GCF. Of course, there are many things we don't like and we're also always writing letters and articles and uh, talking about the things that are going wrong and et cetera. But at the same time, civil society organizations have been very supportive with the replenishment process that is now taking place, the one Jay was talking about. So can you explain why, in spite of its flaws, you want the GCF to be healthy and adequately stocked? You can, I don't know who wants to, to answer first. Um, maybe I can jump in and then, and then Liana can um, come after me. And I'll just say, just um, I also wanted to really echo what you, what Liana said and what you just closed with Florencia is that we are really only as strong as the network of people that we're working with and really only as strong as our uh, partners on the ground and, and people um, whose, whose voices we're, we're trying to bring into the international arena. And so it's a, it's a critical role that everyone across the network plays. Um, and as far as the, the replenishment and, and criticizing the GCF, um, I think you are often most critical of, of people you or things you support the most um, because you believe in them and want them to be better. And that's in some ways how I see the GCF um, because the GCF was really something, and I think that one of the reasons we fight for it so much and, and fight for the replenishment is that it was created to be different and it was created to be different than the IFIs, um, so than the international financial institutions or the multilateral development banks like the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank or the African Development Bank, which work from a very top-down, very donor-driven um, or donor-driven model, whereas the GCF um, doesn't. It has explicit ties to the UN framework, so it has explicit ties to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, it gets advice from those bodies. Um, it also has a balanced board um, that has, you know, that has 12 of the contributor countries, but also 12 of the recipients um, on it. And so the decision-making power isn't, isn't necessarily driven by the contributor countries or the people putting in the money, but is designed to be more balanced. And so in that way provides, is a, is a potential avenue for having greater justice, um, greater equity. It also has explicit mandates related to balance between mitigation and adaptation, as Jay was talking about earlier. It has explicit mandates um, for direct access and really providing that direct access of finance um, and not necessarily going through, through big intermediaries, which isn't always perfect. Um, but because of all of these things, and because frankly of the role that it has for civil society, um, it has the ability, you know, civil society is able to not only be at the board meetings and watch the board meetings, which are webcast, but also be in the room in person and have people who are able to speak and represent the voices of civil society and indigenous peoples and local communities, which is totally not true at, at multilateral development banks whose board meetings and decision-making processes are largely a black box. Um, and it has also over time developed some really strong um, policies 
um, around indigenous people's rights. Its environmental and social policy is, is rooted in human rights. It has an explicit gender mandate. Um, it has a strong accountability mechanism. And so I think for all of these reasons, um, it's, really, it's really what we see as one of the key and main drivers um, for climate finance and, and main vehicles for climate finance and where it should be flowing. And so for that, even though we're criticizing and we want it to be better and to achieve everything um, that we want it to achieve and, and really provide um, the sort of climate finance projects we need and the climate justice we need, um, we believe it can do it better than a lot of these other financial institutions. And so we fight for it to be better while also fighting for it to have the money it needs um, to help combat the climate crisis. Um, and I'll stop there and let Liana come. Yeah, thank you. That was pretty comprehensive, but I wanted to add um, just a couple of thought because I think it's, uh, and it was really comprehensive, but I think it's really important to put it also into um, the broader context of climate finance provision and climate just climate finance provision or uh, climate finance provision, you know, through the lens of climate justice. There is, and we cannot repeat that often enough, there is simply a big difference of whether climate finance is provided through a fund that is affiliated with the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement works under their guidance and its accountability to both the convention and the Paris Agreement or whether climate finance is provided through a multilateral development bank. That starts with the eligibility, the question of who gets access uh, to the finance in the UNFCCC. It's all developing countries. There is no differentiation by, by, by income groups. Um, that includes, for example, in the MDBs, a lot of um, uh, small island developing states and, and some other actors that are very climate vulnerable from accessing finance. It goes back with the form of how finance is provided in the GCF. It's a lot more concessional. While we do have loans, um, uh, the majority of, of, of the, the finance is still provided in form of grants. If you compare that with the multilateral development banks, there is a lot more provided in loans and loans with a lot less concessional terms. It's the issue of direct access again, which is something that funds under the convention and the Paris Agreement, the Adaptation Fund and the GCF actually have pioneered and, and uh, driven up. And this is uh, definitely a game changer because you know it, it does um, empower national and subnational entities to really take charge of um, uh, the, the climate finance implementation and not just be a, 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 a you know a trickle down re recipient. And again, I'm, I think we have to put that into the broader context about where all of this discussion about the climate finance provision for the future are going, who is you know responsible for, for providing uh, sufficient climate finance. And again, the question of who governs that climate finance, right? And um, uh, Erica has alluded to that, to the fact that we have a balanced um, allocation, uh, uh, sorry, we have a balanced representation on the board. And this is actually very, very crucial that that is done in a regionally balanced way um, that put developing countries at least, you know, at an, at an equal footing with developed countries, which we again don't have in um, uh, multilateral development banks. And we certainly have that uneven power of balance in climate finance that is provided bilaterally. So for all of those reasons, we want the GCF to be a better fund, but we also want the GCF to continue be, to be a, a well-funded fund. Thank you so much for, yeah, giving us more reasons to pursue in this. I totally agree with you. So thank you very much for those reflections. And now to continue with the building of hope, which is so important nowadays, could each of you share an experience where you think something worked well? So like a success story where civil society organizations achieved something, maybe one or two of your favorite stories to give hope here so that people continue engaging and building this bridge. Erica, should I start this time off? 
Okay, I'll I'll start with one or two, and then obviously Erica um can can jump in as well. Um, I think we are fortunate to say that despite the fact that we are underfunded, um, maybe even underappreciated, I don't know that, um, we have had quite a number of success stories and it actually started um, from the very design of the Green Climate Fund because civil society has been very instructive in, in the transitional committee process already at that time, and we are talking right now about another transitional committee process for a new fund, the Loss and Damage Fund, which also shows why that civil society engagement is so important at that early stage and brought in a number of core features, including a strong reference um, to gender, including uh, pointing out the importance of accountability uh, uh, mechanisms like a redress mechanism for the fund. So that was from the very outset. But I think um, uh, throughout the years, uh, we've not only um, established a, a strong civil society engagement as well as a, as a, as a right and a push. Um, you know, we've basically tried to expand the door of civil society engagement beyond what was initi initially said in, in the drafting document um, to the point where a lot of, for example, accredited entities or applicants for accredited entities are coming to us beforehand because they are fearful of what we might be saying. And so they are trying to diffuse and discuss issues with us, um, same with the projects. And we have been, for example, able to diffuse, if not outright um, reject some of the projects. So one of my favorite uh, example, um, because it was such an awful project, is actually a proposal that came forward by um, the Korean Development Bank several years ago. Um, who wanted to do what they call the biomass, a biofuel project in um, Fiji and Papua New Guinea, which actually would have led to, um, you know, the wholesale development of wood pellets for export back to South Korea. So not sustainable, obviously not the kind of projects that we would like to see and um, civil society through a strong advocacy push, but also through bringing in technical experts and refuting some of the uh, technical assessment has been able um, to actually uh, lead to the Korean Development Bank pulling that proposal back and it never bringing back to the board. For other projects, we've been able you know, to um, uh, indicate a number of um, conditions that make it better. The, or that would potentially make the implementation better, be it mandates uh, related to gender, be it mandates um, that relate to stronger um, application of environmental and social safeguards with better overview. So I think we've been um, instrumental in that part. Over to you, Erica. Yeah, thanks, Diana. I, I agree with all of that. And, and those were some of the examples that came to my mind as well. Um, I think, the other, some of the other examples that come to mind are, as, as Liana mentioned, you know, really establishing ourselves as, as an important and, and critical stakeholder and stakeholder group that people need to engage with, making it the default that, um, you know, the secretariat needs to engage with us, needs to consult with us on policies as they're developing them, um, having, you know, dialogues with the executive director. Um, at board meetings and elsewhere, um, having accredited entities come to us. Um, one of the things that sticks out in my head, as Liana mentioned, conditions um, or, or things that projects had to do was really pushing for more transparency, particularly in private sector projects and particularly around sub projects. So when the GCF or other entities approve big programs, you don't necessarily know where they're going to take place in a country or even what countries they're going to take place in. And there was very little requirements around transparency for sub projects once the GCF gave the money. And we were able to successfully push um, and to push accredited entities to say, okay, we're willing to disclose those sub projects and we will disclose them to the GCF and the GCF will disclose them to civil society so that you don't just have to go to each accredited entity's you know, website and look up that project to try and see about sub projects. And I think that was you know, largely due to a push by us. And so I think we've been able to make, and because you know, one entity does it, we're able to push it for other projects and other entities 
And I think that's really been powerful. We've also been able to get more documentation about projects um, from both the, the public sector. There used to be many annexes around stakeholder participation and um, other issues that were not disclosed. And now all the public sector ones are disclosed. Um, we're pushing the private sector to disclose more and they're doing that. And I think that really the fact that the entities reach out to us is a credit to, to what we've done. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that we're also able to, when, for example, um, I think it was when SMBC was trying to be accredited, we were able to and largely led by um, APMDD where Jay works and, and organizations to really push back and be like, no, they're funding really terrible um, fossil fuel projects. They shouldn't be accredited and pushed and pushed. And so their accreditation got delayed. They had to develop a climate policy. It wasn't perfect. They still got accredited, but you know, we are able to make at least small gains. Um, and I think that's, those are some of the things that stand out to me. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I see Jay wanted to comment uh, one success story as well. Jay, if you want to come in now, this is the moment. Yeah, I was actually, I wanted to build on what Erica mentioned regarding SMBC because that was really a major moment for Asian civil society and communities. You were able to gather 447 signatures in a matter of few days. And that was really awe-inspiring that forced SMBC to really reflect on its climate policy. And it wasn't just the portion of climate finance that it, you know, it wasn't just on the climate finance aspect of SMBC. It trickled down to their energy policy, which will really um, impact um, communities and the future of reducing greenhouse gases. Since, you know, SMBC is one of the largest um, fossil fuel financiers in the world. And... Uh, this is what really made me smile and um, not just me, because um, as Erica and Leanne have been sharing a while ago, this work is very hard. This is a very, um, it's a very challenging work, coordinating. And we find strength when we see solidarity among our, our organizations and communities work together to save the people and planet. So um, we also did that. They also did the same campaign for the Korean Development Bank. Unfortunately, they got reaccredited, but um, that that shows the um, that shows that we could always do a lot when it comes to the work of the civil um, the civil society network. Thank you, thank you, all of you for sharing these stories. I think it's very important that as we work, civil society works, which. We, it's always hard, you know, we're always fighting against very powerful forces. It's always important, important to remember our success stories and put them there for inspiration and to keep on going. So we're getting to the end of our interview. And I just wanted to ask you one final question, more a question like a um, request for, for inspiration for the people that are listening here. So what are your suggestions at the local and international level of how local organizations can, can get more involved with the GCF? What message would you give to the participants in this webinar who are connected with local organizations, local funds, community-based organizations, etc.? Maybe Erica can start now. Sure, um, and I will just say, um, I think the, the advice I can give or, or what I can say is please, please get involved. Um, please connect, connect with us, connect with the larger network. Please, um, you know, sign up and be part of our listservs and communicate with us and get in touch with us um, so, that we, so that we can reach out to you. Um, and so that we can, especially if there are projects going on in your local communities, if there are entities being accredited, um, if you have questions, if you wanna be involved in policy making, um, as, as Jay mentioned, we are much stronger when we work together and it's a lot of work and um, we can do this. <laughs> we can push to make the institution we want and push for it to be better and get the climate action and, and climate justice that we need, but we can only do it if we're all, if we're all working together and our strength really comes from 
um, from the ground up and from being able to connect the very local level to the international level. And we can't do that without people at the local level and people who are connected to the local level being able to, to connect to us and to the international level. And so I would just say, get involved, get in touch, feel free to reach out directly um, and, and reach out to anyone on this webinar and, and really we can make sure you're involved in the whole, in the whole network. I would just add really quickly because I know we are running out of time and want to have some time to reflect on some of the, the, the questions that have come in as well. Um, but what want to mention to other point, if you see something particularly in, in a project implementation or you fear something about a project, uh, even if it's not yet implemented, um, right, uh, not only reach out to us, but know that there are some accountability mechanisms that civil society has, first of all, uh, and the network has, first of all, be, be very engaged with, also in trying to help shape um, their, their, their policies and procedures, and that we actually have the possibility to bring complaints, bring concerns forward, elevate them, for example, uh, through um, information um, disclosure uh, and information requests and appeals. Um, that force um, the, the secretariat to provide us answer. We've challenged the secretariat successfully on a, on a couple of, of their reluctance um, to release information. So, I mean, it is important. It helps us if we know of concrete trade cases or instances from the ground. The other one is obviously the, the connection to us is really important, meaning to the observer network and to GCF Watch and the regional nodes. It's as a, a, a communication platform as well. But the other one is don't be afraid to look up who the national designated authority or focal point in your country is for the Green Climate Fund, because they also need to know that you exist, that you have an interest in what they are doing and how they are representing their country's interests and priorities to the fund, because they, for example, have to give a no objection to proposals that are coming in, right? And if you have concerns, if you hear uh, about activities going on and you have concerns about it, let um, the, the NDC, uh, NDAs, the National Designated Authorities know. I think this is the other kind of bridge that needs to be done, that push has to be manifold. It has to be on the board, it has to be towards the secretariat, but we also need to let our own national government representatives know that not only are we watching them, but we expect them to do better and engage uh, communities and civil society groups, women's groups, indigenous groups on the ground in the respective country, including for putting proposals or concept note forwards or for um, having engagement plans with the GCF. So I stop there. Thank you so much, Leanne and Erika. It's been wonderful listening to you. I really admire what you do. Thank you for keeping up, for maintaining us coordinated. And well, I, I look forward to, to working more with you and to having you in the next webinars as well. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Camila from AIDA, and she's going to present a shared survey. We'd be very grateful for you to fill so we can better prepare for our next sessions, better understand what, what you need best to continue engaging with the GCF. So the floor is yours, Camila. Thank you, Flor, and thank you also for the great participation of the panelists. I think it has been very interesting conversation. So everyone, I'm going to share my screen now and would like to invite you, please, if you can join us and, and filling out this very short survey we prepared. Uh, we wanted to go live with you through all the questions, but since we're running out of time, uh, we're going to invite you to please go to this uh, link, menti.com. I also put it on the, on the chat box and you can enter the code 27633316. Other option, if you want to answer the survey from your cell phone, you can scan the QR code that's on the that's on the screen. And we have only five or six very, very short questions. And the idea is to uh, know you a little bit better. How do you engage with the GCF? 
Um, also, other topics that you might be interested in for, for other webinars or informative sessions. So if it will be great if you can if you can enter the link and answer this short uh, survey, and then um, I'm going to pass back over to Florencia. So we have this some minutes for the Q and A session. But if we have time, we're um, coming back to the survey results at the end of the of the session. So please, if you can answer it now while we have this Q and A sessions. Thank you, Florin. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Camila. Well, this is this is like a the thing that always happens is that we lack <laughs> time, but we can't be here all day, right? So I have a couple of questions because Leanne has very uh, kindly answered some of your questions in the chat. So please look into the chat to see the answers to the first questions that came up. But regarding the questions that are still there, there's a, a couple of interesting questions for Ira about the GCF Watch platform. And they say, how can we be a part member of this platform? And then there's another one that says, uh, what, oh, I, maybe that was answered already. Well, maybe you can explain, um, Ira, how, a person can be part of the platform. Yeah, hi. Um, so for um, to be part of the GCF Watch platform, um, it would be best if you reach out to the regional nodes since yeah, we will be um, having further discussions um, at, that, at that level to be able to like institutionalize, I think um the membership but for contributions or story contributions any materials that you want to be featured in the website um just feel free to reach out to um to the gcf watch email and yeah we can um we can discuss um and we can um like wait um i'm just looking back at uh, the slide earlier so i can flash the process um yeah so just feel free to reach out to us in case you have any materials that you want to be featured um in the gcf watch platform so here are the contact details that we have and yeah so these stories uh, materials are subject to the review of um, gcf watch um, steering committee and advisory council um yeah, so basically that's the process um, we have for, um, yeah, just to be clear with um, the, I'm just not sure if um, the question refers to the um, story contribution or maybe being an official member of um, the GCF Watch platform and the network. So yeah, I'm answering based on the um, how to contribute, but maybe... Um, Leanne has some it inputs on how um, how the um, civil society organizations can be part of the observer network as well. Yeah, so I'm just not sure if um, it, what the it, question particularly particularly refers to. Florencia, if it's okay for me to come quickly in, because I think, um, Ira, uh, thank you so much. And I, and, and I think, again, the, the populating the GCF watch um, with stories coming up, with experiences coming up from the ground, with analysis is really important. There is, of course, the broader information sharing and coordination level that we have through our listserv, which is the GCF CSO listserv. And actually anybody who is a member of civil society, this is important um, because we, we do also, uh, you know, strategy discussions um, uh, and, and other things related to it. So we are not accepting anybody who is working with um, or is from the private sector or UN agencies, because we think that's a, obviously a conflict of interest. Um, um, but we, um, if you are a member of civil society, um, uh, you want to know more about the Green Climate Fund, you want to, for example, figure out what is happening around the, the, the board meetings, you want some more general information, um, please feel free um, to contact um, uh, either Erica or anybody else of the observer team, and we are happy 
um, to add you to the GCF CSO listserv. Just a, a little bit of a warning that one gets really, really extremely active um, around board meetings because we do a lot of our coordination uh, for civil society input during the court me uh, uh, meeting, um, during the board meetings there, but it's also a, a broader information um, sharing tool. So, and you can be added to it. Um, just write, um, and I type my my email or Erica's email in um, in the chat. Just write to either one of us, and uh, we can add you to the list. Sir. Thank you so much, oh, I've just added also um, the, the the registration link to be part of the list of that we have for Latin America. That's one that functions in Spanish and Portuguese. So there we have all the information from the board meetings, the projects for the region, uh, the capacity building events such as this one. So you're very, if you speak Spanish or Portuguese, that might be very useful for you. Uh, and you can also always reach out to the regional nodes or to Erika Lian and ask because there's so much knowledge here and we want more engagement so it's a two-way street um and then yeah, I think... um, sorry Florencia if I may um I just wanted to highlight one of the questions that I've seen a while ago um someone mentioned that they have developed three country case studies on gender in GCF funded projects. So I'm just not sure which projects they are referring to, but yeah, this is something that we would appreciate in the network and that we want to hear more about um, these updates in the in the um, observer network. And yeah, um, feel free to reach out to, the, to us in uh, the contact details that were mentioned earlier. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ira. I wish we could stay longer, but we're really done with the time. So I think we're gonna have to cut it here. And I'm really sorry for the questions that didn't get answered. Um, you might want to send them uh, by email and I'll be very happy to address them to the panelists so that you can get your answer back. So thank you very much for participating. I'm gonna say goodbye for this session and we wait for you in the next two in October and November. Thanks. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, interpreters. And thank you to all the participants. Thank you so much for your interest. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.